I've actually worked for SAC for about 20, 25 years. So I'd like to say I was born and raised in the company. Um, SAIC is a, um, about a $7 billion a year company. We have about 26,000 employees. Um, and almost all of our work is with the federal government. Um, we also do some um, state and local work as well as a couple of commercial clients, but predominantly we are a uh, federal um, government technology integrator. And um, as a chief technology officer, I'm responsible for our long-term technology vision uh, for managing the research and development of our products and services and uh, fostering a culture of innovation across the company. That's great. Thank you, Charles. And Vinod, if you don't mind, just share with us your background, your role within the organization and what you're responsible for. Absolutely, John. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited and thank you so much for having me. So I'm a chief technology officer at IBM in talent and transformation innovation unit, which is part of global business services. And I support our clients across uh, the industries. So I've been in IT industry for more than 25 years and I've held leadership roles in Ericsson and Tata consultancy services uh, before joining IBM in 2015 as a CIO partner and a PNL leader for large strategic IT outsourcing accounts. So in my current role as the CTO, I wear two different hats. Um, the first one is to lead the technology strategy direction and architecture for our talent platform, or I also call it the open digital skills ecosystem. And I also continuously evaluate and bring suitable partners uh, in our ecosystem. And I'm also enabling the sellers globally. The second part of my role is to advise our clients on learning and skills transformation, partnering with them on their digital transformation journey. And we leverage AI, big data, blockchain, cloud technologies, and we help them create a culture of continuous learning and exponential scaling. I'm based out of Raleigh in North Carolina and happy to be here. Thank you. Great, thank you Vinod so much for the introduction. And I'd like to stay, you know, stay with you. Uh, you have a unique role at IBM as a CTO with, with an emphasis on talent and transformation. Can you tell us a little bit more, especially when it comes to innovation, from your perspective, what are the most common misconceptions that executives face when it comes to building a culture of innovation? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, I mean, in my experience, I have seen a couple of misconceptions. Um, the biggest one for me would be uh, the thinking that you can actually force innovation by sort of assigning targets, right? And I've seen it in, in my past that people are being assigned goals um, to submit at least three ideas every year. That does not work. I mean, that, that really does not work. So we really need to work on creating a culture of innovation, aligning the structure, the tools, the rewards, performance, everything to cultivate a culture of innovation. So that's the biggest one. The other one I would think is that people sometimes confuse creativity and innovation as being synonymous to each other. Um, I mean, you can be very creative, you can have creative ideas, but unless those ideas can be implemented and they bring the impact and value to the organization, it is not innovation, right? Those are just creative ideas which can't be implemented. And third one, I would say it's again a big misconception. When, we, when people think about uh, innovation, they think that it has to be very big, very large and you know, very large scale and all that. But in my mind, innovation can be incremental, uh, small improvements from grassroots, each day being better than the last day, results in large scale improvements over a period of time. And if you think about agile, it actually works on that principle, this philosophy that encourages us to fail fast and iterate over and over again, right? And if we just ask a simple question to ourselves, how can I be better each day? Uh, you will be amazed at the results. And, and I think that's what drives innovation. So these are a couple of misconceptions from my perspective. Great, thank you for sharing that Vinod. Charles, you lead a technology division for a very large organization. Can you tell us a little bit more about the culture at SAIC and more specifically, what initiatives are underway that provide employees with the opportunities to be innovative? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, SAIC is in a business of mostly helping government customers solve really hard problems uh, that are of national importance. And so in, a, in essence, innovation is part and parcel to everything that SAIC does on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, we work in a wide variety of domains, everything from artificial intelligence to robotics, to space, 
ground vehicles, modeling and simulation. We even have a couple of game video game studios where we develop video games for the government. And um, so our, our employees are really working to help transform government services to digital services, uh, modernize their IT infrastructure, and then uh, you know, modernize uh, various systems that are used within the military and the intelligence community. And you know, for example, adopting and deploying edge solutions. So we're doing a lot of interesting work and it's really useful um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But the challenge is that we have a very distributed workforce and about 70% of our employees are normally working full-time at a customer site. When I say normally, that's obviously pre-COVID and um, indications are that probably that model will change because I think the government is probably not gonna go back to 100% on-site type of model. But either way, most of our employees really identify maybe more so with their customers than they do with SCIC itself because all of their time is spent um, thinking in, in about customer, their customer and helping them uh, solve their problems. And so that often means that their voice isn't easily heard when it comes to say corporate innovation initiatives that we have. And when we want to identify where we may be doing things that are um, potentially useful across our customer base, it can be hard to um, say obtain that information. So we've put some programs in place to help kind of break down some of these barriers. And you know, one thing we have is a fellows program and you know, we consider these kind of our techno technology elites of the company about one for a thousand employees. And they are distributed across the company and both in customer as well as corporate roles. Um, we have a research fellows program where, you know, annually we ask uh, employees across SAC to propose ideas for a research fellowship. And, you know, the goal of that is really to fund the kinds of things that they probably aren't going to get funding to do on contract and that we're not likely to invest, say, research and development in, um, in the mainstream because they're, you know, like a little bit ideas that are a little bit more further out there or things that are not really as well understood. And then um, we also host a number of different technology events like that we call our Tech Tuesday events where employees from anywhere in the company can give talks on technology topics and then people from across the company can dial in and, and listen in. And then we also have an annual technology conference where employees share information and you know, about innovations they've done for their customers. And I think these kind of programs really help increase the connective tissue of, of our distributed workforce to the greater company and it helps build connections between the employees across the company so that they can begin to say reuse the knowledge and share the knowledge that they have you know from one uh, one area to another that's great thanks for thanks for these examples and something that stood out video games for the government i'd yeah. like to uh if we have, if time permits to spend a little bit to talk you know hear some examples of that <laughs> uh uh, Vinod, just a little background of what I want to talk to you about next. According to Accenture's U.S. Innovation Survey, about 60% of companies admitted that they did not learn from the past mistakes in relationship to their approach to corporate innovation. Moreover, around 72% of organizations polled said that they often missed the opportunities to exploit underdeveloped areas or the markets. So from your perspective, what is the best approach to allow for mistakes to happen, but leverage these lessons towards the improved corporate innovation results? Absolutely, Jan. I think that's an excellent question. Um, and unless you fail, you're not going to learn, right? So you have to allow for that risk-taking uh, behavior, uh, but not undue risk-taking behavior, but you know, uh, experimenting and learning from what, what you want to do, right? So in my experience, what I've seen is that fail fast is the best technique to allow for those mistakes to uh, take place. So try it out quickly, uh, see if it works, reflect on it and see, you know, what is working, what is not working, and then keep on iterating from there, right? So that's the way you allow for these mistakes to happen, but also learn from those mistakes by reflecting all the time, right? Uh, secondly, I would say in order to facilitate this, you really need to have that open culture which allows for you to reflect on the work and the process rather than the individuals, right? That way you can learn from the mistakes without worrying about blaming or pointing fingers. And also I believe the agile teams where you are together and you are responsible for you know, failing together and succeeding together, that is also one of the important uh, techniques. And it's not just one person, but the team which you know, uh, does things together. And other than that, I would say at a at a at a executive level, we also need to uh, create those open channels for communication by top executives. And one of the examples that I have seen recently is um, IBM's new CEO Arvind Krishna. So he's um, 
holding those open office hours where anybody can join. You can ask any questions and he is kind of answering all the questions, you know, live. So that really facilitates that open culture, open communication channel for uh, these ideas to come out and people to ask questions and understand, you know, what's happening in the organization, right? Uh, one of the other things I would also suggest is social listening, right? So you should be listening outside as well as inside your organization, right? And there are tools which allow you to listen to social chatter and surface the trending patterns from that. And I mean, that could be the leading indicators for future problems, right? So you could even proactively work on those things and, you know, provide, uh, prevent those problems from happening. So these are the various techniques that I think uh, would be really helpful. Yeah, the, the open hours that the executives host, I've seen some examples of mm. very successful leverage of such, you know, communication platform for anyone within the organization to be able to come in freely and ask questions and, you know, share that dialogue with the top executives. I think that's a great example. So thank you for sharing that, Vinod. Uh, Charles, from your standpoint, I want to talk a little bit about the role of experimentation on your teams and how do you leverage these outcomes to deliver better results? If you have any examples that you can share with us, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, I think, I think you know, we are predominantly thinking about experimentation in a couple of different dimensions. And, and one is on the technological side and the second is on the business model. Um, and that's in the business model experimentation is becoming really critical for us as the government is starting to transform how it acquires um, capabilities. But on the technological side, you know, we are not, um, we do not do a lot of advanced, or I say early um, apply, I'm sorry, we do not do um, uh, basic research, that's the term I'm trying to look for. Uh, so all of the research development that we do are basically taking existing capabilities and integrating them into solutions to solve, you know, hard problems. So a lot of our R&D is really about evaluating um, options that are available in market and then figuring out which ones work together the best in order to solve a, a given problem. And then, you know, we want to take that um, and uh, create, you know, say a repeatable uh, architecture or repeatable solution around it that then we can use to tailor it to the needs of, of um, different clients as, as they come up. So experimentation is important for us in the sense that we've got to test and evaluate these technologies. We've got to integrate these technologies and validate that they're actually solving the problem. And then, um, and then as we actually go to implement them, uh, in, you know, in on contract, for example, we want to, you know, take any learnings we get because, you know, doing one, doing something in a lab is one thing, doing it in a, in a live environment is another. So you always gain opportunities to learn and then capturing that knowledge into a knowledge base so that, you know, we uh, get better over time as, as we do um, evolve on these projects. And I think um, on the business model side, that's becoming uh, really important to us because, um, you know, the government uh, for those of you who aren't, aren't really familiar with government acquisition, the government is really slow to buy things. And, you know, when, when they're buying something of, of any sc scale, you know, they, you really have to measure time in that process in six month increments. So it's not uncommon for these acquisitions to take 12, 18 months um, to even be awarded. And uh, the time frame that passes from when they say initially identify a need before they actually start even getting the solution started can be 18 months to two years. It's very slow. And um, the government, of course, know, is you know, aware of this. And so there's a lot of effort in the past several years, I would say decade really, to find ways to accelerate acquisition um, across the government. And part of that is that they're starting to look more at commercial acquisition models and how com commercial companies tend to buy things and how they make decisions. And, um, and that you know, is enabling us to experiment with how we sell. Um, you know, so for example, today, we're uh, pretty focused on, uh, say, contracts that might be 10 or $20 million plus. And um, those are the kinds of things that we're really wired to pursue. Um, but, and we're really good at you know, winning contracts and of that scale or higher. But, uh, but if something comes out, say, in, a, in an agile model where they really just want to prototype in six weeks, that might not be a very large engagement. It's not the kind of thing that SAC has historically been really wired to do. And the government is increasingly using this type of acquisition. So we have to start changing the way we think about it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think one good example of business model is like, you know, commercial customers um, are very comfortable buying information technology in an, in an as a service model, like using cloud services or managed services. Um, and uh, so, 
uh, but the government is actually not particularly good at this and is not necessarily comfortable with it. Um, I think there have been great strides in the past several years because of um, cloud computing, but um, th there still is not, I would say, widespread acceptance of this model of, of um, IT acquisition. So we're exper experimenting with packaging different types of services in these different service models to understand which ones like can get traction, you know, where the government is sort of ready to buy it in that model and where they're not. And so we will formulate a hypothesis about, you know, who the buyer is and what, what type of delivery model they're likely to buy and what the services are that need to be packaged in that model. And then we'll test that. And if we get uptake, then, you know, we think we might have something. And so we'll continue to invest in that. If we can't really get uptake, then, you know, we'll pivot to some other, um, some other business model or solution um, to advance that forward. So that's, I think, um, you know, probably the biggest examples I have around business model innovation is, um, is testing, you know, how we package our services. Right. And that's very unique in the sense as you deal with the government sector, like you've mentioned, there's, you know, probably extended periods of time where you have to wait, where you have to, you know, go procure. Uh, and the role experimentation sounds like plays a critical part in being able to justify pilots and prototype certain services and, and uh, products. So that's very exciting to hear. One book that comes to my mind when we start talking about experimentation is by one of the Harvard professors, Stephen Tomke. He actually, the book, book is titled Experimentation Matters and Experimentation Works. And a lot of very interesting case studies in that highly recommended, especially on the booking.com on how they built that and fostered the culture of innovation. So thanks for those examples, Charles. Yeah, and I just um, want to add one thing. I think, you know, uh, I imagine some of your podcast listeners are uh, in small businesses or startups and, um, and, and the government can be an extremely challenging um, customer to target. And that's an area where a company like, you know, a technology integrator, government technology integrator like SAIC can um, be a pathway to, to government channels by uh, this type of experimentation, because we can work with these, these startups to understand the technology they have, try it out in the lab, prove it, prove its value out, and then we can help um, facilitate um, the implementation of that technology in government contracts, just as an example. Yep, absolutely. That's a great example. Um, Vinod, from from stem at an executive level, obviously data data is king. Data data matters. When it comes to innovation and experimentation and a lot of things that we're talking about, uh, obviously data is at the you know is at the core of that. Can you tell us a little bit more as far as what is the role of data when it comes to measuring the ROI as you choose which strategic initiatives to invest in uh, from the innovation standpoint? Absolutely. Um, data is the new oil, as they you know say uh, these days. So basically for us, there are various parameters that we consider before investing further into an innovation. So things like alignment with the strategic priorities, um, align alignment with the client needs. And also we look at the impact, uh, business value and the investment, right? So and of course, we are a data driven company. Data is the basis of all the critical decisions that we take. Um, including the investments into innovation. And, and business case uh, is something that always plays an integral role in the decision-making process. And when we are developing those business cases, we are actually looking at data from all the sources. So we look at the direct impact. We do look at the indirect impact. We also look at the customer feedback. We also look at the NPS, you know, all, all kinds of data we take into, uh, into consideration, yeah. Yeah, those are great examples, Vinod. Um, and furthermore, Charles, what type of innovation metrics um, that can be implemented to measure the impact of the innovation projects as we talk about data? Yeah, I think um, in my domain, most of the innovation that, that I'm sponsoring is, is really intended to ultimately create a new product or service or create differentiation in, in products and services. So the, the long-term goal is on revenue, um, but you know, there's a whole life cycle there that you have to be paying attention to, you know, when you're making an investment upfront in something, especially something that's fairly new and you don't necessarily know how the uh, customers are going to accept it. Um, you, you need to have some sort of faith that it's probably someday going to generate revenue, even if it isn't like right now. And so to me, I think it's important to have a set of metrics that um, kind of follow that entire life cycle from inception all the way through to um, the future. And, and what I, I think a model that I personally like a lot and I, I try to drive in the company is known in, in, in some circles, especially in the startup community as the pirate metrics. 
And uh, so this was uh, something that came out of a lean startup and book. And, um, and basically the idea is pirate metrics because it's an acronym of A-A-A-R-R, you know, R. And those uh, letters stand for awareness, acquisition, activation, revenue, and referral. And awareness is just saying, you know, are you doing the kinds of things you need to do to make the market aware of the offering that you have? And so, you know, you want to measure things like, are you getting customer engagements? Are you, you know, are you getting um, uh, responses to you know, cold calls when you um, talk to, are you actually, uh, say, uh, creating sales literature and getting it distributed? Are you showing up at conferences and trade shows? Those kinds of things are the kinds of activities that would promote awareness. And if I'm investing money in a team that is not doing any of those things, I can say that the chances that that is ever going to generate revenue is going to be very low. Um, it also tells me that they're not learning from the conversations they're having from their customers, which means that the solution they're building is probably not ultimately solving anyone's real problem. And then their, their second one is around acquisition, which is really where you know people start to um, issue actions that would indicate they're going to buy your offering. And, um, and so in the case of pirate metrics, the model is really focused around like web businesses and app businesses, and they have a very, I'll say rapid um, process of going through this, uh, this set of pirate metrics. In a business like SAC, we have to really kind of reimagine how we would think of these different phases in the life cycle differently. And so um, for us, you know, we focus on awareness. Acquisition is really just, are we getting responses into the government on um, RFIs and on white papers and on prototypes and so forth. And then they talk about activation, which is, are you getting, you know, basically pull through on, on, um, on something. So if you have like a web app and someone has downloaded it, that might be an acquisition. An activation means they've signed up for the premium, right? Well, in our business, that, that doesn't really make sense. So we have to think about in terms of activation, meaning that the client is actually calling us back in and including us in their longer um, procurement process. And then obviously revenue is a major um, uh, measure. And then referral is another one, which is the ability to generate further leads. And that's a little different in the government than it may work in a lot of places, but um, there are avenues for measuring referral in government as well as customer satisfaction. And so those are also metrics that we wanna look at. But I think the important thing is that, you know, if you take a look at pirate metrics to look at it as a life cycle of the journey of, a, of, an, of, a, of an innovation, and then, you know, think about how those different stages in that journey really relate to your business and your business model and cast it in that, in that factor and just recognize using it as it's currently sort of promoted is unless you're doing a web business or an app business probably isn't going to directly translate. Of those examples, and especially with the pirate metrics and government, you usually don't put, you know, the two and two together. Well, it sounds like a lot of the, you know, the metrics in place that you've implemented from the standpoint of measuring the ROI of innovation projects is, is something that's working for you guys, because for innovation projects, you know, the results are not usually immediate and something that you have to measure and constantly monitor usually requires a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty solid infrastructure and, you know, the processes in place to do that. So thanks for those examples. Um, Vinod, from, from a standpoint of balancing or finding the right balance between focusing on innovation projects versus on something that's critical path initiative to ensure that the company is operational, I'm curious to get your take on what are the strategies or best ways or even methodologies to to find that right balance, because we always hear these great stories, companies like, you know, Netflix that allow people to spend, you know, up to 30% of their time to work on anything that they would like. Um, but just in general, what, what, how, how do you find that right balance? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a proven planning process that we use uh, for funding our operational leads and for funding the transformations and the new innovations. But at the same time, we also always strive to optimize our operations, right? We try to make them faster, better, cheaper. Now, in terms of our regular operations, mostly our operations are funded by the clients because we are serving them, we are providing them services. So that's where our revenues come from and they fund the operations. But then we, we, what we do is the innovations that we are implementing, many times these innovations are actually helping us 
um, make the operations more cost effective, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples, such as if you are implementing chatbot for a customer support uh, scenario or the frequently asked questions, right? Or even elevating that to the next level or using some robotic process automation, RPA for repetitive processes. So that's actually making our operations better, right? And when we save money from those operation uh, investments, we can actually reinvest that into the innovations, right? So that's one way we do it. And at the same time, I mean, we continuously invest a large part of our funds into innovation projects from our profits that we make, we you know, put it into investments. And we continuously co-create and try to build an ecosystem to bring more value to our clients. So I would say it is never uh, either or, or situation between operations and innovations. It is always an end decision, right? So you balance between keeping the lights on, making the operations better, optimize the operations, save money from the, uh, the, the operations and invest that into innovation. So this is something that we do internally and we also bring it to our clients. So a lot of, lot of times when we work with our clients, we actually just help them save money from their operations. And that's how we fund the transformation projects. And we do that all the time in the area that I work in, which is the learning transformation and skills transformation. Mm -hmm. Right, very absolutely. Those are great examples. Um, Charles, from a standpoint of generating new ideas for for these the so-called innovation projects, so the new products and services that you guys are looking to launch, um, what does the, the what does that process look like for you guys? So what are the sources for the new ideas for you and your teams? And moreover, how do you motivate your your teams to generate the new ideas? Yeah, so we're, we're actually kind of in a bit of a tran trans transition and focus on how we're thinking about that. Um, and I, I think the key uh, kind of North Star that we are uh, embracing now is, is really the problem statement as the primary way of thinking about the kinds of investments that we're creating and how we, in, in, and how we decide to, in, to invest in them. And so, um, you know, it's really about one, really getting clarity on what kind of customer problems exist that may have broad applicability and where uh, if we can solve that problem for them, they're likely to buy it and also that they actually have money to buy it, right? Those are kind of the three legs of, of problem um, identification. And as a part of that, uh, you know, we have implemented a, a problem identification testing process that helps us take problem concepts and then validate some of those dimensions, at least to a certain degree. And, um, and sort and test it more verbally and, con and in concept with actual customers versus actually getting to an actual product and then trying to see if it sells. So even before we get to that stage, we wanna, we wanna validate that. So one way we collect ideas is in the form of these problem statements. And it's really asking employees across the company who work with our customers on a day-to-day -day basis to articulate for us, what are the um, problems that your clients have that if we could solve it, you know, they would be willing to pay money to, uh, to solve it. And collecting that in a database of problems, and then you know we go through a process of rationalizing those those problems um, so that we have a better understanding of where they're applicable. And then uh, once we've sort of tested a problem, we think it's worth pursuing a little bit. Then we will invest in solution identification, which is where a team will work on a concept around how they would solve that problem. And so that's another way we solicit ideas is in the solutioning to the problem statement. And um, and then once that solution has been identified, then we also test the solution concept again, you know, within customers. And then if that seems to be having some muster, then we'll invest in an actual minimal viable product type of um, solution. And then if it's, you know, if the MVP is proving out, then we'll continue to invest in it. And, um, and we use canvases as a way to capture the data around problem statements and solutions and business model. And, uh, and then part of the investment, you know, especially when we get to the MVP phases and later is around epic hypothesis statements that help us put in there not only technical outcomes, but business outcomes which tie back to these, you know, these uh, pirate metrics I was mentioning earlier that help us, you know, have confidence that as we continue to invest in this uh, endeavor, it's going to generate. But I guess, I guess to succinctly answer your question, we think of, you know, idea solicitation on the problem side, really getting clarity on what the actual problem is, and then also on the solution side and how we would go about solving that problem. That's a great example. And it also, it also the, the employee engagement factor. Uh, to be able to not only generate new ideas, but to engage the employees in that decision-making process. I think that's, you know, it's a win-win situation where not only you engage the employees who are on the front lines dealing with the customers and actually talking about the problems that need to be solved and also making that part of that decision to select particular projects or investments. I think that's, that's a recipe for success. 
Uh, Vinod, I'd like to get your your take on the the very similar process or generating new ideas at IBM. How do you guys go about that? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, uh, Jan. And I think uh, uh, we never have the dearth of problems to solve because we are, <laughs> you know, we have so many clients, we have so many employees, consultants working with the clients and the clients, you know, keep on bringing problems to us or we keep on actually looking at the industry and finding problems that we can solve for our clients in a proactive manner and you know take take the solutions and offerings to the client right so we have this internal offering management process which actually wor works on the similar lines what charles was describing so you know there are problems and then we have this process which actually uh, kind of surfaces out those solutions and offering solidifies them and then takes it to the scale, right? So that's the way we do it. But when I think about the ideas, so as I mentioned, you know, so the ideas actually come from all the sources, right? They come from our employees, they come from our clients, they come from our partners as well, right? So in fact, within IBM, the way I think about it, we are so large and, you know, we have this large global presence. So we keep on getting ideas from other business units within IBM other geographies within IBM. So something that we have done in Latin America is probably applicable in US and other markets as well, right? So there is this cross pollination of ideas taking place all the time, right? And of course we have a lot of ways in which the ideas get shared uh, across IBM. There are forums, we have web webinars, we have events, we have communities. Uh, we have various collaboration uh, tools uh, that we use internally like Slack, Mural, and you know a couple of other tools. There is also internal movement of people. So internal mobility is one of the big things in IBM. So people move within IBM. So they are also carrying ideas from one part to another. So this kind of, uh, you know, all these different ways that kind of uh, uh, allows for ideas to surface easily. Um, we also conduct certain hackathons, uh, you know, internally and sometimes externally as well to uh, generate ideas on specific topics and solutions on those topics. So such as call for code is one of the hackathons that our software division runs very you know, frequently. And I remember one of the uh, uh, one of the innovation challenge that I personally participated in um, and uh, we were actually leveraging a tool called Idea Storm, uh, which allows you to crowdsource innovative ideas from uh, people. And the crowd decides which ideas are worthy <clears throat> to be going to the next round. And this way, the great ideas actually bubble up automatically while this uh, via the crowd wisdom, right? And um, at that time, I had submitted an idea for cognitive minutes of meeting. So basically, uh, you know, if you are having a, a meeting, uh, you would have this cognitive tool which will listen to the meeting, which will listen to what you are talking about. It'll generate the minutes of meeting and even take actions from that and set reminders and set follow-up meetings and you know things like that. And in fact, somebody is already working on that idea already. So that was very interesting. Um, similarly, I would say we also have another way in which we allow the talent, uh, sourcing of the talent for executing the ideas that you have now find out, found out, right? So um, for executing these innovative projects and challenges, so we have a platform wherein you can throw challenges, you can create projects and to execute the innovation and let the AI engine match the talent with these projects and challenges. And this way, what you are able to do is you are able to tap into this talent pool, which is wider than your unit across the organization beyond the boundaries of your business unit, right? So that really helps in um, being able to execute the ideas, uh, the innovation ideas without having the talent uh, you know, within your uh, business unit. So those are a couple of examples, uh, yeah. Right, right, right. No, those are great examples. Uh, especially when it comes to hosting some type of an innovation hackathon or uh, an ability to gather people together and actually brainstorm as a group uh, in the form of some type of a you know friendly competition, I think that could lead to a lot of you know really cool ideas and transformational ideas like what you're talking about. So thanks for those examples. And Charles, you guys host similar events right at SAIC uh, in terms of that innovation council or the hackathon. Yeah, so we have we we have hackathons periodically, and then we also use the research fellows project as another way to kind of advance and, and explore some of these you know let's say more leading edge um, problems where there isn't like a necessarily a clear solution in market for it. 
Mm -hmm. Right, right, absolutely. And Vinod, I love the idea about the AI powered uh, meeting minutes capture, uh, because that's, you know, from project management background, that's one of the one of the pain areas, always to be able to capture really good notes, and then stay on top of all of the action items. I think that's, if you come up with that and go to market, you know, at least you have a buyer in me. Um, <laughs> Charles, you've mentioned an acronym uh, previously from the pirate metrics standpoint. And um, Forbes also suggests that starting with kind of the, the four P's when profits, processes, products, and policies, uh, as far as breaking innovation down into these, into these, into these categories, so to say, and tackling them as individual challenges will allow you to move a little bit faster with more operational agility, I guess, from with what is your approach to innovation when it comes to selecting and launching innovation projects? I know we've talked a little bit about generating ideas but the process for actually selecting what to invest in further, maybe uh, if you could share some insight into that. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the first stage is, is around the problem identification and testing. And, um, and I think, you know, we really wanna understand um, what the problem is and, and problem statements are trickier to write than people think. Uh, so they, they should be succinct. They should be, you know, maybe a paragraph two at the most. They should encapsulate you know, a good understanding of the actual end user of the solution. So, you know, it, it's better not to say, you know, companies in general have this problem or government agencies have this problem, but specifically what kinds of people, like are they engineers, are they managers, are they directors, are they, you know, um, soldiers, you know, what, whatever the actual individual is that's going to potentially use the solution, what is it that they experience that is a problem that we potentially want to solve? And then it's also trying to understand what is the current uh, baseline of the problem, like where, you know, what, what's out there already that, that either they're currently using and that needs to be better or that they could be using and characterizing that. And then also understanding, um, and I, think, I think the other key thing is that those problem statements cannot assume this solution. And that's probably the area where a lot of people get really tripped up. They'll say things like, oh, my customer needs cloud or my customer needs AI. And it's like, well, sure. I, what does that mean you need AI, right? It's in, and AI may or may not be the right solution for a problem. And so you have to really understand what the actual problem is. And then we can determine if cloud and AI are the appropriate solutions or if it's something else. Um, and I think that, you know, once we can get clarity on that, then it's a question around how many of our customers have, you know, what are they, what, what's the magnitude of this say, potential revenue that that problem could generate if we solve it? And then where do we see the demand for this across multiple customers? Because, you know, any large company like SAC that has a lot of different contracts or like IBM, you know, we'll have um, a wide variety of customers. And a lot of times the same basic problem exists across that market. And so areas where we can see that there's a, a broad applicability of that problem and that there's willingness to pay for it, then we would want to um, continue investigating that. And so we have some thresholds that we would use around what we think is worth uh, pursuing uh, and that those thresholds are going to really depend on the size of your business. You know, a big business like SCAC is going to have a higher threshold probably than a small company that um, doesn't necessarily need to grow, doesn't need to land a hundred million dollar contract tomorrow. Um, and then solution identification then is the next stage. And then again, it's really, you know, can we put together a solution that actually solves that problem, does it in a way that they can afford it, um, and that, you know, we can, we can generate profit from doing it. And, and, you know, if it can't pass that test, then it's not something that we're going to invest in. And then if it does pass that test, then we want to do the MVP and really get feedback on that and recognizing that that solution is almost definitely going to morph over time. I think, you know, Vinod uh, earlier was talking about, you know, iteration and learning from experimentation as you kind of iterate on that product, you need to keep uh, continually tune it to solve the actual problem. And, and I think, you know, the other thing that happens in that journey is you get even better clarity of what the problem really is. So I think those are kind of like the major uh, ways we think about it. Um, and then, you know, there's the challenge of getting things connected. You know, we're in a it's kind of a central part of the company, but we want to connect these up into the business development organizations that are actually working with clients. And so part of it is how do we, you know, do we have a good plan for how we're going to communicate out uh, to those different channels so that we can, in fact, um, get additional customers to, to try out the MVP or try out a later version of this of the solution.
Right, right, absolutely. So in summary, having a very structured approach to, you know, not only generating ideas, but evaluating and selecting which ones is, is of utmost importance. So thanks for those examples. Uh, and just real quick reminder for our audience with about 15 minutes left, just feel free to start sending me your questions uh, using the Q&A feature and I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can towards the end. And then for our YouTube listeners as well, just use the comments feature to send your questions in. Um, Vinod, from just uh, from a perspective of smaller companies and startups, they they can they can potentially out innovate larger organizations such as IBM, not because of what they do, but because of how they think. What are your thoughts on framing the right state of mind and the thought process on your teams that allow for the culture of innovation to cultivate? Absolutely. Yeah. And before I comment on that, I really liked what uh, Charles was sharing. And I was chuckling at that time because just yesterday I had that conversation that somebody, you know, just came to me, I want this. And I asked them, okay, what is the business problem that you're trying to solve? You know, what, what's the, what are the challenges? Let's talk about that before, you know, you throw a solution there. Uh, and that was a very interesting conversation when we did a st- you know, step back and understood the business uh, challenge. And, you know, so then we had multiple ideas about solutioning for that business challenge, right? Rather than somebody telling us that this is the solution I want. So that's very good. Now coming to uh, this, you know, thinking that large uh, companies cannot be nimble and and the startups, you know, are nimble and they can, you know, kind of out innovate large companies. Yeah. I mean, in many cases, I think that has been true. And uh, if you are just, uh, you know, stuck to the past and you're not able to see what's coming, uh, you can get out innovated. And there are, you know, uh, examples which uh, all of us have uh, heard about. So things like Polaroid as the, you know, camera company, they, they did get the view to and the digital uh, innovation, but they never adopted it. And, you know, finally they, they're out of, out of the picture, right? But uh, in my mind, um, large companies can also be nimble and they can also work like startups. Uh, so as long as in the large companies, if you create that structure where you have those self-empowered teams, they are able to make decisions themselves within the smaller teams, and they are able to, at the same time, take the advantage of the support system that you get in a large organization, right? The kind of financial support that you can get and the kind of existing client network that you have in the large uh, organization and the market reach you have. So you, if you take advantage of all these things that you already have, but at the same time, create the same structure and mindset in the company, you can be nimble. And at least in IBM, I've seen that happening in last several years. I mean, IBM is a very different company than what it used to be. And in many parts of IBM, actually, I see ourselves almost uh, acting as a startup, right? And in fact, the division that I work for, uh, we have launched multiple uh, software as a service products in last couple of years almost working as a startup. And we have to internally fight for the investments. We have to prove the business value. We have to convince uh, you know, people to invest into our pro- pro- products um, and prove that these are, some, these are the products that the clients will actually pay for and they have real business value. So I think that's the way it works. I mean, so you can have the same startup nimbleness and the culture within large organizations. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll do one last question and then we'll switch over to the questions from the audience. Charles, uh, what, are, what are some of the most in-demand skill sets that are challenging to find in this market, especially when you're trying to cultivate the culture of innovation? And I see some questions from the audience very similar to this one, especially when it comes to spotting the innovative type of person. Uh, what are the different traits? There's three or four questions around that. So if you can comment on that, that would be great. Well, I mean... Uh... So I think from a technology perspective, we have the challenge of uh, uh, that most companies have right now that you know, the big hot in demand skills, of course, are in cloud computing in general, application modernization, you know, being able to work with new application architectures like microservices and, and understanding how to say take monolithic applications and break them up into microservices and put them in these um, cloud infrastructures. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, obviously artificial intelligence and advanced analytics are major skill sets that are, that are difficult to find. And then, um, you know, I think the other kind of hot area for us is an edge and, and getting people to really understand how sensors work and how, you know, say uh, near area, near field communications work and um, how to, uh, you know, understand the impact of that, the use of those kinds of technologies given different environmental issues that come up. Um, 
But one of the challenges we have at SAC that makes this even harder is that because we do a lot of work for the, co uh, for the government, well, you know, a, a significant portion of our uh, workforce is actually has security clearances because a lot of the work that we do is classified. And so uh, a lot of times we're, you know, we have a hard time hiring a cloud person, but what I also need is a cloud person with a top secret security clearance that knows this, you know, specific mission so that they know how to take the use of cloud and apply it to that mission space. And so a lot of times we're, we're kind of in the mode of having to hire unicorns and, and that can be a, a real challenge. And I think you had a second part of that question. I, I, I'm sorry, I think I forgot it. <laughs> uh, as far as the different traits of oh. a particular person be, you know, for you to spot that that particular individual is going to be innovative or if they are innovative, creative thinking. I mean, I think for me, uh, the main thing I look for is that someone has uh, demonstrated a history of, of, of learning and wants to learn and, you know, that they're exploring new ideas and new concepts. Uh, that they've tried things out. Um, some things might have been successful. Some things might not have been successful. Um, if they weren't successful, would they learn from it? Um, but I, I think people who have sort of an optimistic view of the future and, and, you know, uh, and you know, feel excited to continue learning in that future are, are the people who are probably going to be most successful, especially in the technology industry, because things are changing so fast. And, um, you know, it's always good to see what successes and, and demonstrated um, things that people have done over their history. And then, of course, if I need to hire for a specific skill set, knowing that they have that skill set is important. But at the end of the day, the thing that's going to separate, you know, two equally qualified candidates from skill sets is the one that really demonstrates to me that they love learning and that they're going to continue doing that throughout their career. Um, and that this is just the next stage of their journey. And, and you know, they'll be looking for, for others in the future. And yeah, those are great yeah. examples. Thank you, Charles. Um, you know, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to try to group them together because they they talk around the, you know, being innovative while operating in a remote capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is around if all of us, you know, operating in a remote capacity, how can you still foster that that innovation spirit? How do you bring people together? What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Uh and that's possible. Um, and then just going back to the previous question, which Charles responded, so he kind of stole my thunder there. Um, I mean, I totally agree with Charles on that front. For me, learning agility and learning how to learn is, you know, one of the be best skills that, uh, you know, you would want because things are changing, right? And that brings to this question of how do we enable or foster the uh, innovation culture in remote working, right? So, um, of course, we need these kind of collaboration tools and we need to know how to utilize those tools to um, foster that culture of collaboration among everybody and um, capturing ideas from everybody in the remote uh, remote environment. So what I've seen working is, uh, you know, so we use a tool called Mural uh, very often in the brainstorming sessions that we conduct. Uh, it works very well for, you know, large teams, small teams. Um, to brainstorm ideas and get new ideas from everybody. Um, so that is one of the ways. And other than that, I would say there are also other tools like Slack, which works very well for um, uh, communication across the organization, wherein you can also uh, you know, share things with each other, get ideas and, and you know, continuously um, work with each other in an offline, uh, in an asynchronous mode. Right. So these are various tools which are working very well for us. And personally, for me, I mean, I've been working remotely for a very long time. So, I mean, I've not seen any difference. I think people who have probably moved from um, working in office to remote, it's a big change. But uh, in IBM and at least for me, I mean, I've done it for many years and, uh, you know, I think we have to explore all these different tools that I was talking about to uh, continue working and being effective in the remote working environment. Great examples, thank you, Vinod. Uh, Charles, there's a question uh, from from the from the YouTube audience: Is if I wanted to get a job at SAIC, do I have to have a government clearance? Not not all of our positions uh, require government uh, clearances, so short answer is no. Um, a lot of our uh, positions may require you to be able to obtain a security clearance. And so you don't, even for ones that have a security clearance requirement, it's not always necessary that the employee already have that security clearance. So you can go through the process of obtaining it um, after they, after we hire you. Got it. Thank you for that. Vinod, next question. I think you're going to like this one because of your 
background in project management, product management. Uh, the question is something around, does an organization like IBM or SAIC utilize the skill sets such as the, you know, the business project management, business analysis, uh, aside from the, you know, the software development and engineering skill sets? Absolutely, absolutely. So any kind of software development or customer project that we are on, uh, we need business analysts, right, to understand the requirements and convert and communicate those requirement business requirements into software requirements. So that's an absolute yes. And, and, and just to add and expand on that question. So it is not only business analyst roles, but there are a lot of other non-technical roles in software industry, in, in technology industry that are required, right? So things like people uh, uh, with enterprise design thinking skills, people with uh, designer skills, UX skills, are also required. We also need people with uh, change enablement and communication skills, right? So these are all integral part of, because whenever, if you think about a digital transformation project, you need to make sure, so apart from all these techno technical capabilities, you also want to make sure that you are able to communicate the change and you are able to in, uh, enable the people to adopt that change, right? So there are a lot of non-technical roles that uh, companies like IBM and SAIC would require. Great. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, the next question, Charles, is going to require you to pull out your crystal ball. And it's it's something similar to what I, I was actually going to ask as well, is essentially how are you viewing the next period? How are you preparing your organization for that next period? Maybe what strategic initiatives are in place to ensure that continuity and growth and the other couple of questions are all around. Are there positive signs that you've seen and um, just general take on what's coming to us in the future? Well, I, I can't claim that I have a, a, uh, a crystal ball. I wish I did, but uh, you know, I think that topic of that question alone could, could be a whole hour of really interesting discussion. Um, but I would say just kind of in short, you know, we really plan to focus our investments in developing our artificial intelligence analytics capabilities, um, you know, also shoring up our capabilities and or enhancing our capabilities in digital transformation services. So things like helping our customers migrate to cloud and adopt, adopt these modern um, application architectures and build edge solutions. Um, and, you know, one of the like really hard problems that, that the military has is the ability to fuse information from multiple domains like you have, um, you know, uh, airplanes that have that have intelligence information that they're collecting. You have ships in the sea. You've got satellites in space. How do we take the data from all these different domains? And, and, and you have, I'm sorry, cyber activity happening also. How do you take information from all these different domains, fuse that information in a way that is then actually useful and actionable to somebody in the military trying to defend the country, for example? And that's a really hard problem. And it's going to take, you know, all of these technologies I mentioned to solve it. And it also kind of leads to another major thrust for us is what we call digital engineering. And, and you know, SAC does a lot of systems engineering. So for example, we'll take military vehicles and modernize them, give them better armor, give them better capabilities. And um, digital engineering is really referring to this process of moving all of that engineering process into a digital platform so that information um, and models about the thing you're engineering is shared ac across the entire systems engineering lifecycle. And you know, part of digital engineering also means using digital twins as a way of um, predicting um, the performance of systems and then also uh, doing maintenance and, and uh, preventative maintenance on equipment once it's operational and finding ways to say, iterate that solution into better operating modes um, after it's actually you know, operating in, in, a, in the real world. So um, you know, I think those are our major thrusts around AI, um, digital transformation, digital engineering um, are our key uh, key areas. And in fact, um, for those of you who are interested, um, we will have um, uh, some new positions that are being opened up to lead organizations in the, in the AI and in the digital engineering area. So I'd encourage you to take a look if that's something that you're interested in. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. Uh, you know, this is probably going to be our last question uh, because we're running out of almost at the time. There's a question, a couple of questions from the YouTube audience. They are around what trends and ideas that excite you the most. What are you passionate about and what are you currently observing? Absolutely, Jan. So I think for me, um, the learning and skills transformation for the enterprises is something that keeps me uh, busy all the time and I'm very excited about it. So the uh, confluence of these two areas, learning skills transformation and 
technology. And when I say technology, it's AI, data, cloud, blockchain, all of these put together to solve these problems in closing, uh, in helping the enterprises close the skills gap. I think that's that's the most exciting area for me. And I am seeing uh, great advances in AI being used in almost everything that we do. So we are implementing AI in learning, scaling, hiring, compensation decisions. And I'm also seeing blockchain uh, emerging very strongly now in the credential space. So we recently uh, you know, presented it to the uh, committee, government committee, uh, the learning credentials. Uh, so I think these are the areas that are uh, emerging. These are the trends that I am seeing and I'm very excited about uh, you know, what I see in the future. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, I, I guess we are out of time. Thank you guys so much, Vinod and Charles, for your time and Lent expertise today. It was a great, very insightful conversation. And I want to thank all of our participants who joined. And uh, hopefully you guys got uh, you know pretty good value out of this conversation. We've recorded this, so we'll make this available on demand. We'll post all of the links. If there's any other questions, just feel free to send it to us through the registration link that you guys used. And again, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you.